Hey, welcome back. I'm so glad that you have made God's Word part of your day. And I get to be part of it with you. I hope this journey through God's Word is blessing you as it is me. And here we are at day 115, where we read Joshua 8 and 9, Psalm 70, and our second reading in Acts 21. So, opening to Joshua 8. Yesterday the walls of Jericho came a tumbling down after some skillful seven-part trumpet playing while marching around the city for seven days. The city was devoted to destruction, meaning that this was God's judgment upon them. Right after this amazing victory, Israel learned through a man named Akan that keeping treasures devoted to destruction makes oneself devoted to destruction. Joshua 8 The Lord said to Joshua, Take all the soldiers with you and go up to Ai. Don't be afraid or discouraged. I will give you victory over the king of Ai. His people city, and land will be yours. You are to do to I and its king what you did to Jericho and its king, but this time you may keep its goods and livestock for yourselves. Prepare to attack the city by surprise from the rear. So Joshua got ready to go to Ai with all his soldiers. He picked out thirty thousand of his best troops and sent them out at night with these orders. Hide on the other side of the city, but not too far away from it. Be ready to attack. My men and I will approach the city. When the men of Ai come out against us, we will turn and run just as we did the first time. They will pursue us until we have led them away from the city. They will think that we are running from them as we did before. Then you will come out of hiding and capture the city. The Lord your God will give it to you. After you have taken the city, set it on fire, just as the Lord has commanded. These are your orders. So Joshua sent them out, and they went to their hiding place and waited there west of Ai, between Ai and Bethel. Joshua spent the night in camp. Early in the morning, Joshua got up and called the soldiers together. Then he and the leaders of Israel led them to Ai. The soldiers with him went toward the main entrance to the city and set up camp on the north side, with a valley between themselves and Ai. He took about five thousand men and put them in hiding west of the city between Ai and Bethel. The soldiers were arranged for battle with the main camp north of the city and the rest of the men to the west. Joshua spent the night in the valley. When the king of Ai saw Joshua's men, he acted quickly. He and all his men went out toward the Jordan Valley to fight the Israelites at the same place as before, not knowing that he was about to be attacked from the rear. Joshua and his men pretended that they were retreating and ran away toward the barren country. All the men in the city had been called together to go after them, and as they pursued Joshua, they kept getting farther away from the city. Every man in Ai went after the Israelites, and the city was left wide open, with no one to defend it. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Point your spear at Ai. I am giving it to you. Joshua did as he was told, and as soon as he lifted his hand, the men who had been in hiding got up quickly, ran into the city, and captured it. They immediately set the city on fire. When the men of Ai looked back, they saw the smoke rising to the sky. There was no way for them to escape, because the Israelites who had run toward the barren country now turned around to attack them. When Joshua and his men saw that the others had taken the city and that it was on fire, they turned around and began killing the men of Ai. The Israelites in the city now came down to join the battle. 
So the men of Ai found themselves completely surrounded by Israelites, and they were all killed. No one got away, and no one lived through it except the king of Ai. He was captured and taken to Joshua. The Israelites killed every one of the enemy in the barren country where they had chased them. Then they went back to Ai and killed everyone there. Joshua kept his spear pointed at Ai and did not put it down until every person there had been killed. The whole population of Ai was killed that day, 12,000 men and women. The Israelites kept for themselves the livestock and goods captured in the city, as the Lord had told Joshua. Joshua burned Ai and left it in ruins. It is still like that today. He hanged the king of Ai from a tree and left his body there until evening. At sundown, Joshua gave orders for the body to be removed, and it was thrown down at the entrance to the city gate. They covered it with a huge pile of stones, which is still there today. Then Joshua built on Mount Ebal an altar to the Lord, the God of Israel. He made it according to the instructions that Moses, the Lord's servant, had given the Israelites, as it says in the law of Moses, an altar made of stones which have not been cut with iron tools. On it they offered burnt sacrifices to the Lord, and they also presented their fellowship offerings. There, with the Israelites looking on, Joshua made on the stones a copy of the law which Moses had written. The Israelites and their leaders, officers and judges, as well as the foreigners among them, stood on two sides of the Lord's covenant box, facing the Levitical priests who carried it. Half of the people stood with their backs to Mount Gerizim, and the other half with their backs to Mount Ebal. The Lord's servant Moses had commanded them to do this when the time came for them to receive the blessing. Joshua then read aloud the whole law, including the blessings and the curses, just as they are written in the book of the law. Every one of the commandments of Moses was read by Joshua to the whole gathering, which included women and children, as well as the foreigners living among them. Joshua 9 The victories of Israel became known to all the kings west of the Jordan, in the hills, in the foothills, and all along the coastal plain of the Mediterranean Sea as far north as Lebanon. These were the kings of the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. They all came together and joined forces to fight against Joshua and the Israelites. But the people of Gibeon, who were Hivites, heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and I, and they decided to deceive him. They went and got some food and loaded their donkeys with worn-out sacks and patched-up wineskins. They put on ragged clothes and worn-out sandals that had been mended. The bread they took with them was dry and moldy. Then they went to the camp at Gilgal and said to Joshua and the Israelites, We have come from a distant land. We want you to make a treaty with us. But the Israelites said, Why should we make a treaty with you? Maybe you live nearby. They said to Joshua, We are at your service. Joshua asked them, Who are you? Where do you come from? Then they told him this story. We have come from a very distant land, sir, because we have heard of the Lord your God. We have heard about everything that he did in Egypt and what he did to the two Amorite kings east of the Jordan, King Sihon of Heshbon and King Og of Bashan, who lived in Ashtaroth. Our leaders and all our people who live in our land told us to get some food ready for a trip and to go and meet you. 
we were told to put ourselves at your service and to ask you to make a treaty with us. Look at our bread. When we left home with it and started out to meet you, it was still warm. But look, now it is dry and moldy. When we filled these wineskins, they were new. But look, they are torn. Our clothes and sandals are worn out from the long trip. The Israelites accepted some food from them, but did not consult the Lord about it. Joshua made a treaty of friendship with the people of Gibeon and allowed them to live. The leaders of the community of Israel gave their solemn promise to keep the treaty. Three days after the treaty had been made, the Israelites learned that these people did indeed live nearby. So the people of Israel started out and three days later arrived at the cities where these people lived, Gibeon, Chephira, Be'eroth, and kiriath Jearim. But the Israelites could not kill them because their leaders had made a solemn promise to them in the name of the Lord, Israel's God. All the people complained to the leaders about this, but they answered, We have made our solemn promise to them in the name of the Lord God of Israel. Now we cannot harm them. We must let them live because of our promise. If we don't, God will punish us. Let them live but they will have to cut wood and carry water for us. This was what the leaders suggested. Joshua ordered the people of Gibeon to be brought to him, and he asked them, Why did you deceive us and tell us that you were from far away, when you live right here? Because you did this, God has condemned you. Your people will always be slaves, cutting wood and carrying water for the sanctuary of my God. They answered, We did it, sir, because we learned that it was really true that the Lord your God had commanded his servant Moses to give you the whole land and to kill the people living in it as you advanced. We did it because we were terrified of you. We were in fear of our lives. Now we are in your power. Do with us what you think is right. So this is what Joshua did. He protected them and did not allow the people of Israel to kill them. But at the same time, he made them slaves to cut wood and carry water for the people of Israel and for the Lord's altar. To this day they have continued to do this work in the place where the Lord has chosen to be worshipped. Let's turn to Psalm 70. David pleads in this psalm for help against his enemies, and this poem is a repetition of the last part of Psalm 40. The Hebrew title is A Psalm by David. A Lament Psalm 70 Save me, O God. Lord, help me now. May those who try to kill me be defeated and confused. May those who are happy because of my troubles be turned back and disgraced. May those who make fun of me be dismayed by their defeat. May all who come to you be glad and joyful. May all who are thankful for your salvation always say, How great is God! I am weak and poor. Come to me quickly, O God. You are my Savior and my Lord. Hurry to my aid. And now let's return to Acts 21. Paul, Luke, and the other companions arrived in Jerusalem. On the way, Paul heard the prophecies that he should not go to Jerusalem. He received advice from James and the others, which turned out to be disastrous in the end. Should Paul have followed the advice he was given by prophecy? 
My opinion is that he did the will of God which had already been revealed to him before those prophecies. In other words, the information in those prophecies that Paul would be arrested and beaten was from God. The interpretation that Paul should not go there was added by people, and Paul was right in not following their advice. Acts 21 After hearing him, they all praised God. They said, Brother Paul, you can see how many thousands of Jews have become believers and how devoted they are to the law. They have been told that you have been teaching all the Jews who live in Gentile countries to abandon the law of Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or follow the Jewish customs. They are sure to hear that you have arrived. What should be done then? This is what we want you to do. There are four men here who have taken a vow. Go along with them and join them in the ceremony of purification and pay their expenses. Then they will be able to shave their heads. In this way, everyone will know that there is no truth in any of the things that they have been told about you, but that you yourself live in accordance with the law of Moses. But as for the Gentiles who have become believers, we have sent them a letter telling them we decided that they must not eat any food that has been offered to idols, or any blood, or any animal that has been strangled, and they must keep themselves from sexual immorality. So Paul took the men and the next day performed the ceremony of purification with them. Then he went into the temple and gave notice of how many days it would be until the end of the period of purification, when a sacrifice would be offered for each one of them. But just when the seven days were about to come to an end, some Jews from the province of Asia saw Paul in the temple. They stirred up the whole crowd and grabbed Paul. People of Israel, they shouted, help! This is the man who goes everywhere teaching everyone against the people of Israel, the law of Moses and his temple. And now he has even brought some Gentiles into the temple and defiled this holy place. They said this because they had seen Trophimus from Ephesus with Paul in the city, and they thought that Paul had taken him into the temple. Confusion spread through the whole city, and the people all ran together, grabbed Paul, and dragged him out of the temple. At once the temple doors were closed. The mob was trying to kill Paul when a report was sent up to the commander of the Roman troops that all of Jerusalem was rioting. At once the commander took some officers and soldiers and rushed down into the crowd. When the people saw him with the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. The commander went over to Paul, arrested him, and ordered him to be bound with two chains. Then he asked, Who is this man, and what has he done? Some in the crowd shouted one thing, others something else. There was such confusion that the commander could not find out exactly what had happened, so he ordered his men to take Paul up into the fort. They got as far as the steps with him, and then the soldiers had to carry him because the mob was so wild. They were all coming after him and screaming, Kill him! As the soldiers were about to take Paul into the fort, he spoke to the commander. May I say something to you? You speak Greek, do you? the commander asked. Then you are not that Egyptian fellow who some time ago started a revolution and led four thousand armed terrorists out into the desert. Paul answered, I am a Jew born in Tarsus in Kilikia, a citizen of an important city. Please let me speak to the people. 
The commander gave him permission. So Paul stood on the steps and motioned with his hand for the people to be silent. When they were quiet, Paul spoke to them in Hebrew. Let me start us out in prayer. Our Father, how we thank you that you are always with us especially in those times when it seems to us that you have left us. We say with David, I am weak and poor, O Lord, but you have not forgotten me. You are my Savior and my God. Hurry to my aid. Father, we thank you for all the troubles that Paul endured. You told him right from his vision on the road to Damascus that he would suffer much. But you knew that his experiences would be an encouragement to millions of believers who would come after him. And that is us. So today we rejoice in our King Jesus, and we say, May all who come to you be glad and joyful, no matter what the circumstances, and may all who are thankful for your salvation always say, How great is the Lord!